GM, good morning. Welcome to The Milk Road Show, the daily crypto show that's as smooth as Michael Jordan's fadeaway jumper. I'm your host, Jay Hamilton, and this past week was one of the biggest conferences in crypto. I'm talking about Bitcoin Nashville, a massive event where multiple U.S. presidential candidates spoke. So today, we've got our good friend Tyler D on the show to give us the inside scoop about what happened there. Now, before we jump in, today's episode is brought to you by CoinGecko API. Be sure to stay tuned to the end where we'll share an exclusive offer just for Milk Road listeners. Ty, welcome back to the show. Hit us up with what's your quick rundown of the highlights of Bitcoin Nashville? Jay, it was a hell of a conference. So five big things for me. Trump's speech and why it beat my expectations. Senator Loomis, her strategic reserve policy and why it surprised me. My broader takeaways from the conference, including Michael Saylor's mind-blowing predictions. How I'm now reevaluating my portfolio and trading strategy coming out of the conference. And then the, the last part of the show, we got to talk about this. The wildest poly market bet I've ever made, which involved in-depth private jet tracking from one of the world's richest men uh, with an incredible outcome. Yeah, e Elon Musk, in case you didn't catch who he's talking about there. We'll get to that at the end. So you stick around because that story is hilarious. Uh, but let's let's start off at the top, um, uh, give us the lowdown on Trump's speech. What were the highlights from what he said? Yeah, so if anyone hasn't listened to Trump before, I think his speech was very much in line with his classic campaign rally speeches where like he does meander around, he covers a multitude of topics. I mean, he covered a lot of his core like talking points uh, in a very like Trumpian fashion, but he did catch the crowd's attention with this one tagline, which is already starting to go somewhat viral, uh, which was never sell your Bitcoin. Never sell your Bitcoin, right? He was talking effectively about how the Biden administration has been breaking that cardinal rule, how the crypto native crowd knows that the cardinal rule is never sell your Bitcoin. Interestingly, I already saw that tagline being used on CNBC this morning. So it, it is starting to, to permeate. Uh, but then to his credit, after dancing around a little bit and working the room, he did end up touching on effectively all the core key policies that I think the crowd wanted to hear. So he promised to fire Gary Gensler on day one to just raucous applause. Like this was probably the, the most applause he got. I think he even repeated himself because he was surprised how much uh, applause he got from this. He said stable coins will increase the U.S. dollar dominance, and he did praise stable coins. I think that was a bit of a surprise. He promised to end Operation Choke Point 2.0 and actually use that, that terminology. So he was at least versed on that concept, uh, along with just ending the broader war on crypto. He mentioned creating a crypto committee to help regulate crypto in the United States. He committed to re releasing Ross Ulbricht as well. And then I think that arguably the highlight, how he ended his speech, he offered up a new strategic stockpile for Bitcoin, where he didn't necessarily, he didn't bring up the United States buying Bitcoin, but he said the US would stop selling and effectively hold. Uh, so I think to me that the strategic stockpile thing, the mention of, of stable coins and operation choke point were items that exceeded my expectations. I'd actually predicted before he went on, I thought the speech would be underwhelming and I didn't really think he would deliver. Uh, and I think I would call this a win if you are you know, in the, the crypto crowd. And like putting all the other politics aside, looking from this singular issue, I think it's hard to argue that, that Trump is not the more pro-crypto candidate at, at this point in time. Unless uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Gets, uh, gets his name on the ballot, in which case you might battle him for it, but we don't need to go down that path. The, the amazing thing to me is you and I did an episode a few weeks ago talking about the power of stable coins, and here is Trump acknowledging that, which is so true. But this wasn't really the biggest highlight of the day in terms of, you mentioned Trump saying the US is gonna stockpile Bitcoin, but then Senator Cynthia Loomis, who I'm sure many people don't know about unless she's a, a local Senator for you, she kind of stole the thunder. What happened here? Yeah, she 100% stole the spotlight from Trump and arguably from the entire conference. So just, I'll say within an hour of Trump's speech, she dropped her official strategic reserve proposal. She dropped it on her website and then she did go on again. She had spoken the previous day and she spoke about it again on Saturday at the conference. 
Um, so this is the strategic reserve pr proposal where the United States is going to buy up to 1 million Bitcoin over the course of five years and, and hold it on the United States balance sheet, um, along with a few other details. But, but that's the, the core premise of this. As I've been reflecting on this a little bit, hey, this was the blockbuster announcement of the whole thing. We, we thought we might get a strategic reserve policy. Uh, it had been rumored that Loomis was going to do one. Uh, but then I went to her her speech on Friday and no mention of it. So I thought uh, the probability of this happening is, is probably uh, a little bit low at this point. So this was a pretty big surprise when it came out. I'm a little concerned. Like, so why did Trump not break the news? Uh, like he literally had, had just gotten off the stage. And while he gave a very pro crypto, pro Bitcoin speech, he did not mention buying. And then within 15 to 30 minutes, Loomis drops this bombshell. We are going to buy. We're going to buy a million Bitcoin. Uh, which if you do the math is something like 420 per day for, for five years. So just incredible buy pressure. Um, but it is striking me a little odd as I'm reflecting about this is, is like, was Trump not for this? Did she simply just not have time to, to get it in front of him? Because this seems like something that he would have wanted to drop. And and now like, it's raised a little bit of concerns for me, like of how realistic this is actually going to be to pass. Um, but regardless, I think just the, the any non-zero chance of this passing and happening is big enough for the market that we have to take it seriously and, and evaluate like what it would mean for each of our individual portfolios. Yeah, obviously, if this did pass and Senator Loomis is just proposing this, so there's many hurdles it has to go through to pass. But if it did pass, it would be absolutely enormous, not just for Bitcoin holders, but for all governments around the world would likely, very likely follow suit and put Bitcoin on their balance sheet as well. Because if America is doing it, then they'd say, hey, why not us do it as well? Uh, what do you think, what what are the next steps? And like, what do you think is the likelihood of this happening? When do you think this might happen? Like, give us some timeline here. Is this just like big hype right now? And then we can expect more. Does Trump need to win president, do you think, in order for this to happen? Yeah, so one quick note. We already are seeing the impact across the world. So Hong Kong spoke out this morning that they're now looking at strategic Bitcoin reserves. So, so dominoes are falling uh, across the world. And I feel like an immediate impact is additional nation states are, are looking at this and, and taking it seriously. So even if the U.S. doesn't get it passed, I mean, they, they could effectively get beat to the punch uh, and, and the outcome could, could still play out. Uh, but with respect to like the reality of this, uh, I, I want to say some of the, the, the previous crypto policies that Loomis has put through have taken years to come to fruition through Congress. Uh, so I, I'm looking at this from a very conservative fashion. Uh, I do think most likely it would require a Trump presidency for this to to get pushed through. And even with that, like we're, we're likely talking like t late 2025 at, at the earliest if it does end up getting passed. And I've already seen a lot of criticisms of this policy of like how this will actually get done, like where the money will come from. Uh, so and I'm not going to get into that, but there's just a lot of questions about the actual, actual blocking and tackling of how the United States – uh, would come up with the funds to to do this. Um, so in a lot of ways, it feels like a campaign promise. Like if I'm if I'm being totally honest, um, but it is a, a promising one nonetheless. One that has at least got the the gears of Washington spinning and, and working. And perhaps an, a positive outcome would be if it gets the the Democrats to the table. And a, lot, a broader conversation starts happening about you know how to actually put some type of uh, regulation framework in place to, to make something like this happen in the future. Awesome. Let's go to what else came out of the conference. Uh, you mentioned Michael Saylor's uh, wildly bullish Bitcoin predictions. Uh, what were your other takeaways? I think one, and we talked about this a little bit, but the crypto is, is becoming increasingly political in the United States. Uh, and the Republican Party is is leaning in hard. So like the, the Loomis speech uh, from the day before very much came off as like a campaign rally. If you were there, it was very light on, on crypto topics it, itself. It was much more about like rousing the crowd and dropping the sound bites to, to get applause, which we did see a little bit of, of in the Trump speech, but Trump went a little bit further to, to his credit. 
but now we're, we're starting to, to see more and more of this divide, which I think is a, a negative thing. And I know we've got a, a global audience here, um, but we, we don't want an outcome where if Republicans are in power, it's pro-crypto, and then if Democrats are in power, it's anti-crypto. So we're just constantly flip-flopping. So that's more and more on my radar, uh, but it seems like the Dems might be coming to the table. So that's good, but certainly something that I feel like exists now that did not exist nearly as much. Uh, you know, four years ago. Kamala Harris did not show up just to bring that up because there was lots of teasing talk that she would show up, but she didn't, correct? Correct. No Kamala. All of the politicians who were there were all Republican. Uh, so we heard from a variety of Republican politicians, uh, no no Democrat politicians, but we, we will see if that changes. Apparently they're trying to have a, a crypto roundtable with some of the leading companies. They're getting a little bit of pushback. So we'll see if they're able to to get that to happen on the backs of this. Perhaps on a, on a lighter note, Michael Saylor is more bullish than anyone that you know. He's more bullish than anyone that, that I know. Uh, you know, he came out, he laid out his incredible $280 trillion market cap base case for, for Bitcoin by 2045, uh, along with a whopping 1,000 trillion. Is that quadrillion? I'm, I'm not even sure like the right word to use. That's his bull case. Uh, for effectively what the, the price of Bitcoin will be by 2045. So that is a 1,000x from here. And to his credit, he made a pretty compelling supporting argument there in his 30-minute presentation, at least I thought, uh, for how we could get there. And then for, for, for putting 80% of one's wealth into Bitcoin or more, if someone was interested in watching the replays from this conference, or at least somewhat Bitcoin interested, I would tell them to watch this this speech and at least and go into it knowing like it, it's Bitcoin propaganda, like it is one hundred percent Bitcoin propaganda. But it's it's propaganda that if if there's any non-zero chance that this could play out the way that he sees this playing out, effectively, inflation continues to happen. Uh, more and more institutions, corporations start stockpiling Bitcoin. It gets on their balance sheet. The, the rate of return effectively continues for 20 years. Maybe some of the numbers aren't that crazy in the scenario where even if it's 5 or 10% chance that it does happen, the returns are big enough that that would make someone seriously consider having at least a small portion of, of their portfolio in Bitcoin. So at least that's how I'm thinking about it. I think the other one... And to be clear, uh, the... The, the predictions you gave were the market cap predictions that he said, uh, which would work out to what were the price predictions of what Bitcoin price would be if these market cap predictions are correct? Yeah, we buried the lead. So his bear case for 2045 is $3 million per Bitcoin, $13 million base case, and then $49 million per Bitcoin bull case. Bitcoin is 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 sixty five thousand dollars, right? Sixty seven thousand right now. He's saying it could be three <laughs> to forty nine million per Bitcoin. Now by twenty forty five, this is like twenty one years from now, so it is it is a ways off. But whoa, whoa is like the only way to respond to this. Uh, I, I think we could probably spend an hour just going through the all the reactions to this. I think one for me though, I think there was a very common rating no just comment for, to take profit and, and i think for those who who need to, to take profit uh, to fund their individual lives uh, sure of course that makes sense but if you believe that these are the price targets like why would you ever sell your your bitcoin i understand selling other assets nfts altcoins meme coins 100 percent like sell those take take profit because a lot of those are, are going to zero or going to zero against the crypto majors but if you believe this is actually a scenario like to me, like you should be trying to, to do everything you can to stack more. And, and so like now that I'm starting to think about that. And he actually says in his speech, one of his takeaways is don't quit your day job. Keep the income streams coming so that you don't feel forced to, to sell. And, and it says don't over leverage. Effectively, just you know, don't get wiped out. So other than thinking about stacking more Bitcoin, what were the takeaways for you from a portfolio allocation perspective? Has it has it changed what you've done with your own portfolio? I mean, it just happened, I know, but your plans? A, a bit. So I was already looking at this cycle as primarily a Bitcoin Solana barbell strategy. And I think this this conference reinforced that. So the, the other takeaway, and I haven't got there yet, is beyond Bitcoin chatter, which of course there was plenty of, it was Solana chatter. There, there really was not much ETH 
or, or Ethereum related chatter in, in the smaller events and smaller conversations with people, it was meme coins. It was Solana growth. Um, and that kind of reinforced it for me is keeping that chunk of the portfolio along with Bitcoin. What was missing from, from the conversations I was in was really any substance around ordinals and runes. Uh, I had higher expectations for their presence, a little bit more bullish energy. And with a few exceptions, like the Taproot Wizards were all over, Udi and team, I think they're, they're doing a great job. Um, but for me personally, not interested in, in buying uh, any more runes or ordinals until something changes. Because this brings up a good question around what is the purpose of Bitcoin as a blockchain? And there's, it feels like there's this divide of people who think it should be a smart contract blockchain and are focused on fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens on top of Bitcoin. And then there's those that are like, no, let's just be digital gold and stop doing everything else. Was there, which direction did you get a sense of where the wind is flowing right, blowing right now? I think there was a lot of conversations on like DeFi on Bitcoin, but all the the higher level, harder hitting conversations were more on the the digital gold, uh, and perhaps that was more of the, you know, because the the senators, the Michael Saylors, the, the Trumps of the world, they're, they're more in the they understand it at a high level. They don't understand like the DeFi components of it. But like at the, the boots on the ground level, like you don't want to lose your Bitcoin. <laughs> like it, it, like it's going to go up. To, to anywhere close to this, right? Like you don't want to screw up and, and buy you know something that's vaporware. So I'm still, I do believe that that DeFi will happen and we'll see you know a larger crypto economy on Bitcoin, um, but it's going to be something I'll be watching more at arm's length until it feels a little bit more, uh, you know, there's a little bit more of a confidence level. Mm -hmm. And and I think unlike ETH and Solana and many other smart contract blockchains, which need DeFi to succeed, Bitcoin does not need DeFi to succeed in order to succeed. So uh, a, a a point for the simplicity of Bitcoin, to be honest. 100%. Multiple CEOs and multiple corporations announced either personal holdings for the CEOs or holdings on company balance sheets at this conference. In fact, in between speeches, uh, they would just put it up, they would just flash it on the big screen. And I'm, I'm not talking like three or four, I'm talking like dozens. Like dozens of different individuals, big hitting CEOs, you know, corporations with like nine to ten figure ten figure market caps uh, have Bitcoin on their balance sheets. So uh, that is a, a very important trend to watch, and I feel like it's further than I than I thought it was. If I'm being if I'm being honest, I, I didn't realize this degree of people and companies were actually holding. And now like the, it's like the, it's the domino, right? It's the, the signal is now out there and it's easier to copy. Like, CEOs who don't want to be too far on the risk curve can, can point to others who have done this. And now it is an easier sales pitch. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, love that. All right. Any uh, final takeaways before we get to the Elon private jet story? Let's get there. Okay, give it to us. All right. So I, I think you've talked about Polymarket uh, on, on the pod before. I've been consciously hey, wanting give give the context quickly though. Give the context quickly. Poly market is the the leading prediction market. It resides on Polygon. You can bet with crypto. I think they're now working with apps like MoonPay to allow credit card onboarding. And you can bet on news events. You can bet on the election. That's where a lot of the, the volume on their market is stemming from. Uh, but there was a particular bet tied to Bitcoin Nashville, which was will Elon Musk give a speech at the Bitcoin conference. So I was looking at this and I would originally bet no. So th this market, it spiked to like 30% yes for Elon to speak at this conference on Monday because his jet was in Memphis, Tennessee. And, and I'm, I'm looking at this, I'm like a, a, a billionaire like Elon Musk, who's very busy, is not getting to Tennessee five days ahead of his potential speech. So th this is total nonsense. Uh, so I, I went and made the the no bet. I, I ended up getting in around 79 cents. So about 79%. A chance to get like a 25% return. Not too bad. Felt like it was low risk. Fast forward to Thursday in Nashville. And I'm in an Uber from a liquidity event uh, back to going to another event. And kind of out of nowhere, the Uber driver said, like I, I had someone in the, in the car yesterday who said, Elon Musk is going to be the surprise guest speaker at Bitcoin Nashville. 
Are you sure that's what they said? Like, did this person seem like they were tied to the conference? Can you, can you tell me their name? So I had heard enough. After grilling her, we actually had her take her back to the hotel so I could go and, and switch the bet. So I sold my yes shares. They had gotten to like 94%. So I still got like a 15% return and then flipped to yes. Ended up betting $700. It would have won 10K if it paid out. So it was around 14 and a half to one. Uh, so this was a long shot. So that was a part of the, the, the logic for me. We'll perhaps come back to that. Um, so we made the bet. At this point in time, I start tr- tracking his jet on Instagram. Not, not a ton of action. Meanwhile, there's tons of rumors on the ground in Nashville that Elon is coming. It's, it's not just my Uber driver at this point. It's starting to spread on Twitter. There was some chatter that he was already there. I, I wasn't buying that because I had been tracking his jet. So it, Elon flew to Paris for the Olympics opening ceremony, and he was tweeting from there. Uh, so he was there Friday night. Odds were still low. I knew this was still a, a long shot bet. And I knew he had to leave Saturday morning by like a certain time for this bet to have any shot. I wake up Saturday morning. The first thing I do is I, I check my phone. I go to his jet tracker. He's left. So he's up in the air. So <laughs> he had left in enough time to get to Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so I actually switched from a more static Instagram link. Uh, a, a buddy of mine had a more a better live tracker. So I'm live tracking this. His jet enters the U.S. airspace about three hours ahead of the Trump speech. We're like he, this could actually happen. He lands in New York. Oh no! Like, this, this is <laughs> oh <a> no. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually looking at potentially just, uh, you know, tail between my legs. Can I get out, you know, at, at, at 2%, get some liquidity? There was no liquidity. So I, I couldn't even sell the bet. i uh, like, all right, it's zero. We lost. Uh, I kind of go, go about, I'm, I'm doing some other things. I'm, I'm not trekking. I, I get, my phone starts blowing up about an hour later. The jet's taken back off. <laughs> it's, it's in the air and it looks like it's directly on a path to Nashville. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of glued to this thing at this point. So I'm just, tracking this jet, like refreshing every, every few minutes. And this coincided with at the event, they had made an announcement that there was a special guest speaker coming. Oh they in fact God. had delayed the Trump speech by an hour for this guest speaker. Oh so every, everything was lining up. Uh, this is a, kind of a, the best case scenario. The odds on poly market had spiked to about 25 cents. The, the jet's taking off. I'm following it live. I'm starting to live tweet it. He's getting very close to Nashville. I'm like, oh, okay, we, we, we got to see this jet start to descend soon or he's just going to fly way past it. I'm sweating. Odds are going down. And then the plane starts descending and it starts descending at like 1,500 feet per minute. Again, the stars are aligning. When, when I made my yes bet, there were only like $25,000 in action on this bet. Uh, it closed with $1.6 million. Oh my so God. This became, this became a viral bet during all this. So, so, so fast forward, he, he's, he starts to descend. He's, he's still getting past Nashville. Like, Oh no, he's going to have to turn this plane soon. Long story short, he ends up landing in Memphis at, at this point. Like we were so close. We, we lost the bet. Then one last out. So Eleanor Trinit, like she, she comes out and tweets that Elon was secretly in Nashville the whole time that he was spotted at dinner in Nashville last night, and that he was going to speak. The odds spiked one more time. I think they got back to like 25, 30%. Time elapsed, no Elon speaker. In fact, I'm not even sure a guest speaker ended up coming to the event. Uh, the bet went to zero. It was a hell of a ride, probably the most fun I've ever had. And again, like 1.6 million ended up getting bet on this thing. Uh, I think it was within a 14 to one chance of it actually happening. And I had multiple chances to, to cash out up two to four X on the bet. Uh, I didn't want to do that because my tweets have been going viral and like look like I'm like trying to like manipulate or, or dump on people. <laughs> so I made the conscious decision I'm going to hold this to zero or or 100 percent again, and it was uh, it was a fun ride. Tyler, you are a gambler at heart, my man. I I respect the gambling mentality you had to go into this, but I mean I think the main takeaway to me is exactly what you said: is was Elon ever? So- tied at all to the event was there and and i think the answer is probably yes there was probably some communication it clearly didn't happen who knows why but even the fact that it was possible you know all the all the stars are aligning for more and more attention on crypto and on bitcoin from bigger and bigger sources and more trust and it's no surprise with elon i mean tesla has been a big supporter of crypto and of bitcoin for a long time so uh Love to see it. 
Tyler, thanks so much for joining us today for the great story and for breaking down this amazing conference. Uh, everybody who missed it, I hope you got everything you got from Tyler. If you have any questions, make sure you follow Tyler D on Twitter because this guy will be keeping us up to date on lots more throughout the week. And before we wrap up here, we're just going to take a minute to hear from our sponsor. Thanks so much. Have a wicked awesome day, everybody. Every crypto project needs reliable on-chain data. At Milk Road, we trust CoinGecko API for dependable crypto prices for you. And it's not just us. CoinGecko API supplies thousands of crypto projects with comprehensive data, including prices, market trends, NFT data, and on-chain DEX data. Best part, its integration and developer resources make it easy to set up. Friends of the Milkman, guess what? You get a free trial right now. Visit coingecko.com forward slash API and use code MILKROADTRIAL today. Thank you for listening to Milk Road Radio, the easiest path to get smarter about crypto. If you like this episode, share it and hit subscribe or follow so you don't miss out on the next one. There's also a link in the description to our free five-minute daily newsletter where we simplify crypto for you while making you laugh. And if you're willing to step up your crypto investing game, then we'll leave a link to Milk Road Pro as well, your number one resource to help you invest successfully in crypto. One final note, this podcast is for educational purposes purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto is risky, so you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you friends, and we'll see you in the next one.